Good morning. We are so grateful to have you all join us today for our first ever Branching Minds MTSS Summit, Branching Forward, Setting Intentions for the New Year. My name is Maya Gatt, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Branching Minds. I am that person because I was a classroom teacher who shook her fist at the world and said, there has to be a better way. There has to be an easier way to leverage the advancements from academia and technology to better support myself and my colleagues so that we could effectively support all of our students holistically. I took a chance while on maternity leave from classroom teaching to see if there were others who shared those same pains as well as that drive to forge that better way and have been overwhelmed with gratitude to learn that there are so, so many of us. So Branching Minds was created to serve as a system level partner to districts striving to achieve effective MTSS and make all those best practices actually practicable. We do that work through our web application, through our tools and infrastructure supports, through our professional learning and coaching, through the content we create, webinars we host, and now through this live summit. So we have organized the learnings today around three dimensions of the work to strengthen as we step into the year 2022. Data-driven decision-making, achieving equity and addressing disproportionality, and strengthening SEL and behavioral health. Within each focus area, we will be hosting a session to teach a best practice, to provide a bright spot success story, to delve into discussion through a panel and unpack how the work applies in secondary education. We also have three incredible thought leaders, each providing a keynote, and I gotta say, I'm pretty excited to learn alongside all y'all and get reinvigorated for the work ahead in the new year. The summit is a free event to make sure costs wouldn't be a prohibiting factor. We did, however, select a charity to spotlight and raise funds on behalf of. So we chose Project Night Night, which is an organization that focuses on supporting homeless children's academic, cognitive, and social emotional well-being. So thank you to those who chose to make a donation, Branching Minds has matched all contributions. Lastly, I want to share that we are grateful for this opportunity to come together as a community, even in this very virtual world, to learn alongside one another and from each other. The platform Whova allows us to connect, so we encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A feature. Our team will be answering your questions and relaying them to the speakers. The summit learning today is not about branching minds, but if you want to learn more about the work we do, please join our coffee chat or come talk to us at the exhibitor virtual booth. It is now my great honor to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. George Batch. Dr. Batch is Professor Emer em Emeritus and Doc Director Emeritus of the Institute for School Reform at the University of South Florida. He's also the Director Emeritus of the Florida Statewide Problem Solving Response Intervention Project for the Florida Department of Education. In addition, Dr. Batch formally directed the student support services and coordinated student health projects for the Florida Department of Ed. His contribution to the MTSS space is large and valued. As an advisor to the Branching Minds team, we continue to be exceedingly grateful for the insights he shares and the questions he challenges us with. Speaking of questions, if you're on a desktop, you can drop your questions to the right of your screen, as well as chat with fellow attendees. And if you're on mobile, there's a feature at the bottom of your screen to do this as well. I will be helping to answer your questions throughout the session. And Dr. Batch has offered to reply to any questions that we don't get to today uh, after the session. So without further ado, it is my great honor to introduce Dr. George Batch for his keynote talk titled MTSS, Integrating Academic Behavior and SEL Instruction and Supports to Ensure Equitable Outcomes for All Students. Thank you, Maya, I appreciate it very much. Um, and I want to thank Maya and her team for bringing this summit together and for doing it with amazing virtual expertise. Uh, the Hoover has been fun to get to know, and I've already answered some of your questions. Um, I was looking at who's here today, and a number of my colleagues from here in Florida. Um, uh, Melissa, hello. Um, Oksana, I will uh, answer your question about secondary MTSS. Try to during this short keynote, but I will answer it um, through the Hoova as well. And, um, and thank you very much. So a couple of things to get started. I'm gonna share my screen. Awesome. Let's see here. Whoops, hold on. Excellent. So we're gonna get started. Some of you know me. Um, I know some of you, and um, Maya has put down the gauntlet by asking me to do a keynote in 55 minutes. I'm not sure that's possible, but here's the format for today. We have some goals. 
uh, understanding the importance of district level integration. Um, how, what's the relationship between leadership and uh, integrated MTSS and student outcomes? We're gonna talk about different processes for integrating A, B, and SEL. We're gonna take a look at some interactive data uh, approaches. And there's a personal reflection journal that I think is posted in the chat box. If I'm wrong, Maya can jump in. Um, knowing that this is a short keynote, I created a personal reflection journal. If you choose, you can download the PowerPoint and the journal. And then back at the ranch, you can choose with your colleagues to have discussions around the eight or nine main points that I want to make today. So you will see a reflection time slide and a number as we go through the presentation. That number corresponds to a reflection number on your uh, personal reflection journal. So I am sharing it on the chat. I shared, I shared it previously, but here it is again. This is the, the link to Thank access you, to make a copy of and, and access the personal reflection journal. And uh, this is what it kind of looks like, except uh, Maya and her team have pre it up. I have not seen it, but um, I'm sure it looks better than what I have right here. So that should incentivize you to go look at it anyway. So a couple of things first about MTSS. It's been around a long time if we include the RTI movement. It actually began a multi-tiered system of delivery supports in the health, in the health world. Uh, and Rochester Institute of Technology did a lot of that work back in the day. MTSS is, was included in ESSA as a framework um, for providing services for students. And as a result, um, with the funding that came here most recently, recently during the Recovery Act, um, school districts across the country are using their funds to try to implement MTSS. A lot's been communicated about definitions, critical components. It's been implemented in small, rural, and suburban and urban districts with varying levels of success. That's key for today. And in some ways, MTSS has become so common that everyone's pretty sure they can spell it. But if you ask people, well, what is it? Um, that's not necessarily so fluid. So we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about the must-haves that have to be present if you want MTSS implementation to be successful. We believe through our work that if they're not present, then you will have barriers to successful implementation. And our must-haves are elements that we have identified as critical to successful implementation from our work in diverse types of districts across the United States. MTSS is a way of thinking. It's a mindset. It's a framework. It is not a program or an intervention. So the first critical element to success is having everyone think about the services they deliver through an MTSS framework. You could call that consensus. You could call it common language, under, common understanding. You could call it shared beliefs, but there needs to be a collective mindset around MTSS. There are critical components of MTSS that you're probably familiar with, six of them. But the point of this slide is that all of the components except tiers of instruction actually inform the impact of instruction. So you'll see here, the arrow just pointed from leadership to instruction. We're gonna talk about what kind of leadership has the greatest impact on effective instruction. Capacity building, what does the infrastructure look like? If you don't have the infrastructure, it's going to have an adverse effect on instruction. Communication and collaboration is critical. Multi-tiered systems of support is great, but how do you integrate them? Now that we've divided it up into tier one, tier two, and tier three, if we're not careful, we end up with silos. Tier three providers not knowing what's going on in tier one. Tier one not knowing what tier three is doing. So communication and collaboration is critical if we want instruction to improve. Obviously the use of data, and the research is clear that having data doesn't necessarily do a lot to improve outcomes. It's how you use your data. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. And when you don't know what to do, you have to have an evidence-based 
empirically supported problem solving process to remove or eliminate barriers to what you're trying to implement. My point here is that if any of these elements are missing, we see negative effects on the impact of high quality instruction. Hold on here, it doesn't wanna move there. The other thing I wanna very briefly mention is that everybody looks at the triangle. We want people to look at a diamond. This is not a, just about students who struggle for below grade level or subject area expectations. It's also for high performing students, particularly high performing students who are experiencing stress, social emotional kinds of reactions, adverse behavioral reactions. So our question is, which way do you have a triangle or a diamond? Uh, hopefully you'd think about a diamond. So this framework, it is the optimal framework to integrate academic behavior and SEL. Why? Because all six of these components apply equally and are relevant to academic, behavioral, and social emotional content. Those six elements have to be present for all three of these. In addition, the tiers of instruction and support are relevant and identical for academic behavior and social emotional domains. What do we do for all students, some students, a few students? Going up the tiers, it's increasing intensity of instruction and support. That's the same for all three areas. Time, we increase time. Focus, we narrow the focus to the areas designed to remove or reduce barriers. And the type of instruction and supports may change as you go up the tiers. Data collection to document effectiveness. All of these things apply to academic behavior and social emotional factors. So some of the must-haves, leadership alignment and integration, district office is organized and integrated and aligned to implement effective leadership models, strengthening instruction and supports in tier one first, common language, common understanding, highly effective instruction in tier one, universal instruction, instructional strategies that are evidence-based for different demographics and needs of students simultaneously. An integrated lesson planning process to ensure all providers across the tiers are on the same scope, sequence, and pacing as tier one. Database decision-making and the district implements a comprehensive MTSS evaluation model. We're gonna discuss many of these today. There must be a prevailing belief in the entire district and understanding that the purpose of this work is to ensure leaders and teachers have what they need to accelerate the performance of all students. I got a question earlier today, and, and I appreciate uh, the question about how do you get gen ed involved? MTSS is a general education initiative. It has to begin on the gen ed side in order to sustain. The idea that special ed or an intermediate district or a special ed unit, special ed co-op can get it started and hand off the baton has been demonstrated clearly not to work. So we don't want to bring in gen ed. We want to start it with gen ed. We're going to talk about how to do that. All roads lead to instruction. If what we do doesn't improve instruction, if we don't use our data to improve instruction, if we don't communicate and collaborate to improve instruction, if we don't lead in a way that is related to improved instruction, then what we're doing, I think, is a waste. So here's the question in your next meeting, whether it's an IEP meeting, an MTSS meeting, a data review meeting, at the end of this meeting, what have we done based upon the purpose of that meeting to improve the impact of instruction? And if the answer is, we don't know, then there's work to be done. So must have number one, leadership alignment. There are five things that we wanna do first before we begin implementation at the skill level. We want a board of education policy stating MTSS is the framework for schooling. 
We want the superintendent to be the face and the voice of MTSS. Superintendents direct stakeholders are district level administrators and building principals. I was a principal for many years and uh, we don't want every building doing something different because then we don't have equity. If the building you go to in a district determines how successful you will be and that level of success isn't uniform, then we have lack of equity and access. District strategic plan incorporates the MTSS components. The district leadership team is assigned allocated time to do the MTSS work and the district needs to develop their own definition of MTSS. So the next number of slides are examples of districts we have worked with, board policy examples, uh, strategic plan examples, and a most recent district that I'm working with, their definition of MTSS as of October of 2021. So take a look at those. Reflection time number one is basically asking you to reflect on your district infrastructure and readiness to do MTSS. The relationship between academic behavior and SEL um, has implications. How we implement it at the building level has implications for the district office. Let's remember this. Every task we ask a student to do has three components to it. Does the student have the skill to complete the task? Whether that's an academic skill, whether it is a cognitive skill, whether it is in the student's behavioral repertoire. Do they have the skills? It's from the behavioral perspective, uh, can't do, won't do, right? Do they have the skills? The second is, do the, does the student have the behaviors to organize and implement the skills? And if not, what teacher practices can scaffold student success? And lastly, does the student have the social emotion learning skills to engage the task? And if not, what do we do to sustain student engagement? So a student may have the skills, they may have the behavior, but their social emotional mindset at the time prevents them from engaging the task. The point here is, is that all three of these are involved in every task we ask students to do. So at the district level, if the, if the PBIS unit is in one place, if curriculum and instruction is in another place, if social emotional responsibilities are in another place, it's okay if they're in another place, but it's not okay if they don't meet to integrate their decisions around implementation. I've said before, I'm a strong believer, for example, and you may hang up on me at this point, I'm a strong believer that the Office of Special Education should be under the Division of Curriculum and Instruction. Kids with disabilities get better with good instruction. Um, they've got to have their instruction integrated or included in gen ed classrooms. And if the goal is to you know, keep the superintendent from wearing stripes uh, for violations of of IDEA or state special ed rules, that can be done from anywhere. So if we really believe that these should be integrated, we need to look at how we have our district office organized. Remember this, when the demand of a task is greater than the student skill level, then that task itself serves as an antecedent for both behavior, escape avoidance, and social emotional outcomes. So how can we separate a behavior team from an academic team from a social emotional support team? We can't and we shouldn't. So it doesn't make sense that the district units of curriculum, behavior, SEL operate in isolation. How does that superintendent ensure that the divisions in the district office make every decision together when it comes to students? Because Skill, behavior, and social emotional is involved in every one of those decisions. So this second reflection is really asking you to take a look at the district organization. Is the organization in your district a barrier to the implementation of an integrated MTSS? And if so, what are your thoughts about how to deal with that? Must have number three, 
effective leadership models that are empirically related to positive student outcomes and staff engagement. So here's reality. Leadership explains about 25% of what predicts variation in student learning across schools. Classroom factors explain more than 33%. So between these two factors, leadership and classroom, we have control over 60% of what explains the variation in learning across schools. We don't have control over some community things. We don't have control over some family things. We do have control over this. And if leadership, the model of leadership at the district, but most importantly at the building level, does not reflect models of leadership that grab that 25% for improving student learning across schools. We're leaving 25% of what can help students on the table. That puts more work on teachers. Teachers have to do more than their 33% if we leave 25% of the leadership on the table. We can't do that. And a good superintendent understands that different approaches to leadership have different outcomes for students and staff. So what is the primary function of leadership? Provide direction and exercise influence. And those of you out there and those of us who have been in district and school leadership roles, whether you know what the research says or not, you know you come to understand this. You provide direction and you exercise influence so that direction becomes a consensus. Notice it says exercising influence. This is not collaboration. It's collaboration. So the type of leadership does matter. Collective leadership, and the definition is down at the bottom, has a stronger influence on student achievement than individual or hierarchical leadership. Higher performing schools award greater influence to teachers, teacher teams, parents, and students, the student voice. School leaders have an impact on student achievement primarily through their influence on teacher motivation and working conditions. So working conditions, how can you implement MTSS if the staff doesn't have the time to collaborate and communicate? You can't. And teachers' motivation, ensuring that teachers get frequent positive feedback and supports for work that may be a heavier lift. When I was a building principal, I spent the vast majority of my time in classrooms, not in my office. And being involved with teachers in the moment, having protocols for behavioral disruptions where teachers are supported, teachers are given the choice. Do I handle this student and the principal take over the class? Or do I want the principal to handle the student while I keep teaching? Those are all courageous conversations that good leaders have to keep teachers motivated in difficult times. Rapid principal turnover has moderately negative effects on instructional climate. And rapid principal turnover explains a modest but significant amount of variation in student achievement across schools, unless the principal coming in continues the work and the same belief and leadership style as the principal who is leaving. Harvard Ed has done some wonderful work on looking at the effect of school improvement initiatives in the face of principal turnover. And in one study that, that has become pretty well known, they determined that when a principal change occurs in the middle of a school improvement initiative, all movement toward that initiative and student growth stops for approximately 18 months. So this whole issue of leadership is critical when you're implementing MTSS. The influence of parents and students is significantly related to student achievement, obviously, and student achievement is higher in schools where teachers share leadership and where they perceive greater involvement by parents. The, the idea that a teacher is not supported by the parents because they're not involved is, is devastating for teachers. It's very difficult for them to maintain their motivation in the face of that. So here's some references you can check if you wish. Reflection time 
Number three really asks you to focus on this whole issue of leadership style and are you getting the full 25%. Must have number five, consensus around common language, common understanding of using MTSS. It addresses the collaboration and communication. So very quickly, a quick primer. The tiers are differentiated by time, focus, and type. More time as you go higher, narrower focus, and perhaps more targeted type of instruction. We've already talked about what kind of tier do you want to have? Is it going to include everybody or just some students who are struggling for grade level performance? Remember, this is from USDOE, that specially designed instruction for students with disabilities in special ed occurs at all levels of the triangle, not a separate tier. So tiered systems of support, the mindset. What do all students need? What can everybody do to support all students? What do some students need? What can everybody do to support some students? What do a few students need? What can everybody do to support a few students? Whether that's a student in special ed who is also included in gen ed or a student who is receiving tier three intensive services, Everybody includes the gen ed teachers a partner in that. So are the counselors, psychologists, behavior specialists, EL teachers. What we don't want to have is as you go up the tiers, bottom to top or left to right, right to left, that you have fewer people to support the kids with the higher needs. That makes no sense. So this is everybody is all in. At the building level, it's the principal's um, leadership that ensures this mindset prevails. Need to get the slide to move. And so remember, these are just some, some remembering, this just happens to be for tier one. Tier one is the fewest minutes of instruction because if you go to tier two or tier three, it's more. The focus, it's the broadest focus. Take the five big, big ideas of the co critical components for literacy, phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. As you go up the tiers, you're likely to focus on one or a few of those and the type of instruction. It should be universal, driven by universal de design for learning strategies, and it has the fewest formal assessments. The, addition, the other tiers, you're intensifying them. So here's what I like to do when we are working with the district in the beginning stages. After we're sure that every, we've had a lot of time to discuss what the critical elements of MTSS are, what the purpose of it is, what it looks like, the difference between the tiers, et cetera. We ask people in the room to get into dyads and we give them 30 minutes to develop a one minute elevator speech. And we give them this scenario. You are in the central office, you're getting on an elevator or walking down the hall, whatever. And a teacher says to you, I heard the district is thinking about implementing MTSS. What is that? And you have one minute to engage that person. It's a tough task and it's a great exercise. So you might consider it. So alignment and integration across the tiers. Remember, all roads lead to tier one for everyone, regardless of where you're getting support, more intensive instruction, everything leads to tier one. So why is tier one so important in MTSS? Because it sets the scope, sequence, and pacing of instruction for all students. It determines the curriculum aligned to standards for all students. It sets expectations for behavior, engagement, and social emotional skills for all students. It determines the instructional and support strategies for all students in tier one, and it provides leadership and support for inclusive classrooms or not. So everything we're gonna be doing in tiers two and tier three has to play out in this environment created by tier one. And if it doesn't, if kids getting tier two and tier three level of supports do not improve in tier one, then those supports are ineffective. 
all roads begin and end in tier one. And for that reason, when you implement MTSS, at least the first year, year one is tier one. Must have improved core instruction for all students first. You cannot intervene your way out of instruction in tier one that's not effective for the students that you're concerned for. You simply cannot. An IEP and a special ed teacher cannot fix a student with disabilities. It takes everyone and tier one plays a critical role. You're well aware that one of the best predictors of student growth for students with disabilities is level of inclusion. Not a seat, not a place, but inclusive instruction. So tier one has to improve first. I'm gonna show you, there's a lot of research studies that document this relationship, but rather than show you the research studies and give you the statistical numbers, I wanna show you some district stuff. A strong relationship exists between the performance of all students and performance of diverse learners. And I have a bunch of these, but in the interest of today, I'm just gonna show you two. This is grade four district A ELA progress. On the left side, all students. This district grew 20% in the performance of students in roughly uh, three assessment windows, um, two to three years. Look on the right at the rate of growth of students with disabilities in grade four in that district. The lines are very similar in their slope. Now look at district B in the same state. They had about a 15% decline and look at the slope of the line for students with disabilities. A strong relationship exists. So reflection four has, is asking you to, to cogitate on some courageous questions about this content. Must have number six, highly effective integrated instruction and support strategy starts with tier one. Let's we cannot separate academics, behavior, and social emotional. We cannot. Effective instructional practices are the foundational pro protective factor for social emotional wellness. Effective instructional practices results in improved academic skills. The better you get, the better you feel. We all know just from doing FBAs and looking at an antecedent behavior consequence type of model that some kids act out in order to escape or avoid a task. And they're successful at it. So it tends to reduce their level of whatever the social emotional factor was that felt better to them by escaping it. However, that's not helping them because now they're not getting the academic skills. And ultimately, they're not gonna feel good about the fact that they continue not to be successful. So where is our first social emotional learning initiative? Ensuring we have effective instructional practices for all students. So effective instruction, there's lots of ways that you can do this. This section is asking you to simply answer the question. In your district or in your school, what supports do you have to ensure that the instructional strategies you select are in fact evidence-based for the students with whom they're going to be implemented. And the easiest way to do this in a short presentation like this is to reflect on the work of John Hattie. We could select instructional strategies that are evidence-based for a typical general education classroom and then differentiate or refer for levels two, three, or specially designed instruction. And remember differentiation is not specially designed instruction. Or we could select instructional strategies that are evidence-based concurrently for diverse learners. So the thing I want you to think about today is when your gen ed teachers are lesson planning, whether that's at the elementary, middle or high school, whether it is um, by teaching teams by grade level or subject area folks, when you're thinking about what strategies, and remember curriculum is, is what is taught, instruction is how it's taught. 
There's less variability in curriculum in standards driven world. There's huge flexibility in instructional, the how to teach it. So let's just, I'm gonna just pique your interest here. Direct and strategy-based instruction are highly effective instructional practices. This is an effect size meter. Anything in the zone of desired effects tends to move things just beyond basic teacher effects. But when they're combined, that effect size moves up to somewhere between 0.77 and 0.84. Anything over 0.4 is good. So if we know that, then why aren't we using strategy-based instruction? Let's take a look at this. Some of you have seen this before. Uh, collaborative strategic reading instruction basically demonstrated that if you use strategy-based instruction, which by the way, is a general education instructional strategy, it's not special ed, that students, typical learners grow at the same rate, the top graph up here, the top mark. Students in this case with learning disabilities, grew at the same rate as students without learning disabilities, the gap still existed, but the growth rate, they didn't lose anything. But when that instruction was done, not in a general ed classroom, the rate of growth slowed. So we have choices of different approaches to compreh teaching comprehension. Why wouldn't we teach the ones that are evidence-based for kids with and without disabilities? That's universal instruction. In our work in Florida with our strategic instruction model that was part of our state professional development grant. This is an example of a middle school in math when, when a strategy-based instruction approach in the case of SIM using content enhancement routines, what the effect was on students with disabilities, the lowest 25% of the kids, the growth was phenomenal. All of this was done in tier one with all of those kids included. We have models that are available for high school level, um, math enhanced anchored instruction. And the work by this team demonstrated that the uh, enhanced anchored instruction improved performance for students with disabilities. But when those students with disabilities got it in an inclusive setting, they scored higher than students with disabilities who didn't get it in an inclusive setting. And a couple of other thoughts about SEL here. Teacher-student relationships, look at the effect size, 0.72. How we provide feedback for students, 0.72. Providing feedback for students, the method we use is a social emotional strategy. Because when we provide feedback, we cannot demotivate a kid. The kid has to understand that that feedback, it honors what the student did well and giving the student support to do even better. Teaching students self-verbalizations, teacher voice, private speech, metacognition strategies, private speech. These are all ways that students can self-regulate and have particular impact on the decisions they make about their behavior and about how they feel about the particular context that we're in. So high quality academic instruction, content match to student success, frequent opportunity to respond, frequent feedback can by itself reduce problem behavior. We know that. So I am very high on the work of Kathleen Lane and her colleagues at the University of Kansas. This resource is about how to utilize seven behavior support strategies in the delivery of instruction. What are the best practices in active supervision, in behavior specific praise, giving instructional feedback? The cool thing about this in the, in the districts that I work with, each, each school takes one strategy, there are seven, one strategy a month, it's like a book report. And seven months in, everybody has worked on, become proficient in, and adapted these seven strategies for their own work in the delivery of instruction. So for example, opportunity to respond, struggling students and students who are not engaging, 
unless a student responds, a teacher does not know whether the student is getting it, whatever it is. So it's the responsibility of the teacher to provide strategies to increase opportunity to respond for students who are struggling, whether that struggling is at low performance or high performance. That's integrated into the delivery of instruction, not waiting until some behavior or social emotional event occurs that there has to be some kind of reaction to. So I would really like you to think about in this reflection five, do we have universal instruction? How do we know that our instruction is effective for the students we wanna work with? Are we aware that the instructional strategies we use for our curriculum in tier one can in fact be one's evidence base for multiple groups of students simultaneously? Lesson design and delivery. Um, lesson planning is how teachers determine the how they're gonna do the what. But in a multi-tiered system, you can't have a teacher, a special ed teacher delivering specially designed instruction out of the scope, sequence, and pacing of instruction that that student is going to encounter when they're in tier one. You can't have a reading specialist working on vocabulary for a student that struggles with vocabulary when that vocabulary is out of some box. Why aren't we working with the vocabulary that the student is actually exposed to in tier one? And unless the different providers, including counselors, school psychologists, behavior specialists, speech therapists, unless they're aware of what the task demand is in tier one, they can't help in a way that is going to help that student use those strategies in tier one. And unless that general ed teacher is aware of what is going on with these other service providers, that teacher has no idea how to incorporate what those other providers are doing in that general ed classroom. I firmly believe that the biggest strength of universal design for learning, the principles, are in guiding our lesson design. The three principles, I'm sure we all know these. How do we use different ways of presenting materials and tasks for students that have different skill levels? It, I'll give you an example. Fifth grade student reading at the second grade level. There are ways to find out whether students know the vocabulary for words that they can't read, but they use their words, you use those words correctly every day, even though they can't read them. So how do we ensure that kids have equity and access to overcome the barrier of a fluency issue? We don't keep them reading at their level of fluency. We find approaches that enable them to bypass their fluency issue in order to have equity and access to the content. Students who can't read very well, not fluent, typically can't spell above that level of fluency unless they memorize a series of letters or phonemes. So why would we ask students to write something for a fifth grade assignment when their fluency level is second grade? How do we get around that? And then the last thing is for when we construct these lessons, how do we know that we're gonna recruit interest with students based upon culturally responsive issues, um, ensuring student choice, uh, sustaining effort and self-regulation if we don't think about that? So here's a task I do when I do work with schools on integrated lesson planning. We have different, we have teachers at tables and I ask the teachers to think about a lesson that they're gonna be presenting tomorrow. Give them a couple of minutes, ask them, raise their hand when they have that lesson. I ask them to take out a piece of paper and a writing instrument. I then ask them to close their eyes, pick up, pick up the pencil, close their eyes and see themselves teaching that lesson. And when they see themselves doing it, raise their hand, not the one with the pencil. I then ask them, write down the first names of all the students who are not engaged in your instruction. 
and they write down typically 20% of students. And then I asked them, if you knew who these students were, why did we not make provisions for that when we did the lesson planning? Why do we wait until they're disengaged to do something? We should have built in utilizing these three principles, what we were gonna do for those students to ensure their sustained engagement. So food for thought about UDL. Um, there is a number of integrated lesson planning processes out there. These steps basically describe um, the flow. Step one is all teachers involved with instruction for a greater subject area attend an integrated lesson planning. We do it once a month. We use Google Docs to post those lesson plans. And if they get changed, then when the gen ed teacher changes them, everybody else gets a prompt uh, to go in and look for the changes. Um, Non-tier one personnel meet to plan their scope, sequence, and pacing of instruction based upon what they heard at the lesson planning. The teachers in tier one and the other tiers, whichever ones they are, and specially designed instruction, communicate their lesson plans with level one teachers. And those level two, level three, SDI teachers, EL teachers, they spend time observing their students in tier one to see whether or not what they're doing with the student makes sense and whether or not that student is transferring that to the gen ed classroom. Uh, Indiana has a really nice lesson planning guide for all gen ed teachers. You can look at this later, but the last three questions ensure that in each lesson planning, they have to address what technology is used to increase access or deepen learning, to ensure that students have access and are able to engage appropriately in the lesson, include all aspects of student diversity, and what evidence-based strategies for differentiation for all students can be provided. Best differentiation for all students, universal instruction. So this reflection six is really asking you to take a deep look at your um, lesson planning and instructional practices um, to ensure uh, consistency and continuity across the tiers. Must have number eight, using data to demonstrate relationships between critical factors. I see so many databases that have academic behavior, social, emotional, but we want to use data in a way to help us understand the impact of one factor like attendance on another factor like student performance. Academic engaged time is a fundamental principle here um, because academic engaged time is the best predictor of student growth. And if you wanna Google the research on that, feel free and learn more about it. In behaviors that result in a loss of engaged, academic engaged time is critical. What metrics do we use in an integration model? Not the number of days missed, not the number of behavior referrals to the office, but in fact, converting those days and referrals into minutes of instruction. Teachers engage, you talk about how gen ed teachers can better engage. Teachers have a greater understanding of the impact of discipline practices, loss of attendance, on their student performance when they look at it from an academic engaged time perspective and not a behavior perspective. This is a wonderful, um, if you can go to Attendance Works to find more about this. The question is, what was the impact of chronic absenteeism, 10% or more of available time on beginning third grade fluency using Dibbles? And you see that chronically absent pre-K, K first and second, you see where they performed. No chronic, no years of chronic absenteeism, but early absenteeism is the best predictor of later absenteeism. So this is not just, you know, my you know, kindergarten isn't that important, pre-K isn't that important. Show this chart. It is important. And it's very difficult for early literacy skills to recoup the effects of chronic absenteeism. This is some work um, 
Randy Sprick, uh, Anita Archer, uh, myself, Steve Kukuk, a couple of people worked with Wichita Public Schools for a, a number of years. And we started using, they started using interactive data. This is an example of the relationship between attendance and student overall performance at elementary, middle, and high school. This district um, had about 100 schools. You see at the elementary level, there's not a huge difference, about 10%, if there's an attendance issue at the elementary, 78 to 71. At middle school, it's more pronounced. A big 20% point difference in performance of students. Um, and uh, this is reading, I believe and attendance, and it recouped a little bit in high school. Th what we've learned is that things that go awry have the biggest adverse impact in middle school, but you probably already know that. Now look at the effect of math. It doesn't look like reading. Reading looks pretty good. Math does not, even at elementary. Kids are exposed to a lot of ELA stuff outside of school. They are not exposed to math stuff. So what we know is that attendance has a great, greater negative impact on math progress than literacy progress. And this is the one time where the high school numbers are different, lower, and that's because of the spiraled nature of, of, of math curriculum. So attendance does not have equal effect on different academic areas, nor at different levels. Only interactive data will tell you that. Now look at the worst data. This is for students. 20, the top 25% of all students with problem behavior referrals. The takeaway is that problem behavior referrals, things like suspension, have a far greater negative impact on student progress than does attendance. If we didn't have interactive data, we wouldn't know that. This is a really cool study. You can get it at pbis.org that took a look at these are Wisconsin schools, different uh, racial ethnic groups uh, and students with IEPs in their initiative to reduce suspension as part of their school-wide PBIS um, process. And you see what happened between 29 and 2016. On the left, suspensions. On the right, accelerated performance for academics. Once again, the relationship. Here's the, what we use with school boards. In this period of time in this research study, Administrators saved 601 days of work dealing with managing those suspension protocols. And the students gained 10,525 cumulative school days of academic engaged time. That's why. George. Positive learning climates, I know we have like one minute. Yeah. Classroom structure predictable schedule, the classroom structure will value add teacher effects. Reflection seven covers that content. The last thing that I want to say about social emotional learning is the SEL approaches talk about teacher instructional practices, integration with that curriculum areas, organization, culture, and climate, and explicit instruction. If we take a look at the five domains that CASEL puts forward and the competencies, and you overlap that with social skills training programs like skill streaming, they're identical. We don't have to have separate programs. We can integrate them. So if you look at, for example, teacher instructional practice, the impact of effective instruction on student wellness, that's how we integrate SEL. The last thing that I'm gonna not talk about is use of data and early warning systems. There's a couple of things there, but finally, do you have a comprehensive system of evaluating your MTSS implementation? So Maya, thank you. George, thank you. What an incredible way to start off our day. The chat has been a fire with people excited about all of what you've been sharing with us. Uh, just to remind folks that if you have questions for George, we didn't get a chance to go through them today, but if you add them to the Q&A section of the chat modal on Whova, George has offered to respond to the folks there. Um, and also we have shared a couple of times, I can share it again, the PDF of George's deck, as well as the, um, the reflection journal, the link to the reflection journal. So I just wanna say thank you everybody for engaging so much uh, on the chat and the Q and A. Thank you, George, for sharing with us. We really 
really are so grateful to have you here today. And I hope folks enjoy the rest of their sessions. Uh, and I'm excited to continue to learn with you all. Thank you Thank so you, much. Thank you, everyone. Have a great holiday season. Have a great holiday season. Thank you.